Uh, David's life full of ups and downs. And this chapter, just another testimony to that, up and down. So, it's a little bit down this, this week. Starting in verse 1 here. Now there happened to be there a worthless man whose name was Sheba, the son of Bikri, a Benjaminite. And he blew the trumpet. You're hearing the shofar sound there. We have no, and he said, we have no portion in David, and we have no inheritance in the son of Jesse. Every man to his tents, O Israel. So all the men of Israel withdrew from David and followed Sheba, the son of Bikri. But the men of Judah followed their king steadfastly from the Jordan to Jerusalem. And David came to his house at Jerusalem, and the king took the ten concubines whom he had left to care for the house, and he put them in a house under guard and provided for them, but did not go into them. So they were shut up until the day of their death, living as if in, wid in widowhood. Then the king said to Amasa, Call the men of Judah together to me within three days, and be here yourself. So Amasa went to summon Judah, but he delayed beyond the set time that had been appointed him. And David said to, uh, to Abishai, Now Sheba, the son of Bikri, will do us more harm than Absalom. Take your Lord's servants and pursue him, lest he get himself to fortified cities and escape from us. And there went out after him Joab's men and the Carathites and the Pelathites and all the mighty men. And they went out from Jerusalem to pursue Sheba, the son of Bikri. When they were at the great stone that is in Gibeon, Amasa uh, came to meet them. Now Joab was wearing a soldier's garment, and over it was a belt with a sword in its sheath fastened on his thigh. And as he went forward, it fell out. And Joab said to Amasa, Is it well with you, my brother? And Joab took Amasa by the beard with his right hand to kiss him. But Amasa did not observe the sword that was in Joab's hand. So Joab struck him with it in the stomach and spilled his entrails to the ground without striking a second blow. And he died. Then Joab and Abishai his brother pursued Sheba the son of Bikri. And one of Joab's young men took his stand by Amasa and said, Whoever favors Joab and whoever is for David... Let him follow Joab. And Amasa lay wallowing in his blood in the highway. And anyone who came by seeing him stopped. And when the man saw that all the people stopped, he carried Amasa out of the highway into the field and threw a garment over him. When he was taken out of the highway, all the people went on after Joab to pursue Sheba, the son of Bikri. And Sheba passed all, through all the tribes of Israel to Abel of Beth Makkah, and all the Bikrites assembled and followed him. And all the men who were with Joab came and besieged him in Abel of Beth Makkah. They cast up a mound against the city, and it stood against the rampart, and they were battering the wall to throw it down. Then a wise woman called from the city, Listen, listen, tell Joab, come here that I may speak with you. And he came near to her. And the woman said, Are you Joab? And he answered, I am. Then she said to him, Listen to the words of your servant. And he answered, I'm listening. Then she said, They used to say in former times, Let them but ask counsel at Abel. And so they settled the matter. I am one of those who are peaceable and faithful in Israel. You seek to destroy a city that is a mother in Israel. Why will you swallow up the heritage of the Lord? Joab answered, Far be it from me, far be it, that I should swallow up or destroy. That's not true. But a man of the hill country of Ephraim, called Sheba, the son of Bikri, has lifted up his hand against King David. Give up him alone, and I will withdraw from the city. And the woman said to Joab, Behold, his head shall be thrown to you over the wall. Then the woman went to all the people in her wisdom, and they cut off the head of Sheba, the son of Bikri, and threw it out to Joab. So he blew the trumpet, and they dispersed from the city, every man to his home. And Joab returned to Jerusalem to the king. Now Joab was in command of all the army of Israel, and Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, was in command of the Carathites and the Pelathites, and Adoram was in charge of the forced labor, and Jehoshaphat, the son of Ahilud, was the recorder. And Shiva was secretary, and Zadok and Abiathar 
were priests. And Ira the Jairite was also David's priest. Amen. All right, coming to this chapter today, we will have three points and then three applications. Our three points or sections will be first outside rebellion, looking at Sheba, the son of Bikri, the outside rebellion. Second point, the inside rebellion. That's Joab is rebelling against David, even as he's pretending to serve him. And then the third section will be the wise woman and the melon. So outside rebellion, inside rebellion. It's a little rhyme there. The wise woman and the melon. So, Okay. So uh, remember where we are. Victory has gone to David. Um, Absalom has perished. The rebellion has ceased. And David's marching back to Jerusalem. And the tribes of Israel are going to him, including Judah. Um, because they had switched over to Absalom, so they're coming back to him. And remember at the end of the last chapter, they're quarreling. Israel is quarreling with Judah. And so here that comes to a head, and this man, a worthless man, good for nothing, Sheba the son of Bikri, he says, oh, I got an idea. I'll, I'm just going to get control of this thing. So he gets out his shofar. I don't know if everyone had one or what. Someone in your crew had one, so you called for the shofar. Doo, doo, doo. You know, they did a little, little, little nice... It apparently takes some skill, but you do that little trumpet sound there, the ram's horn. He blows the trumpet to try to get everyone's attention, and it works. And what he says... To, uh, he's on Israel's side. He's a Benjaminite. He, what he says to the people on that side is... It's a little poetic here. It's written in poetic form. We have no portion in David. So he's spitting bars here. We have no portion in David, and we have no inheritance in the son of Jesse. In other words, it's hopeless. David is not going to give us anything. We don't have any hope in him. Maybe he's saying because we rebelled and we went to Absalom, now he's not going to give us anything, any grace or blessing. Uh, this is not true. This is a lie. But it sounds pretty good to everybody, so they believed him. It says, All the men of Israel withdrew from David and followed Sheba, the son of Bikri. So they all left there. They're at the Jordan River. And only Judah now, the tribe of Judah, is left with David, and they attend him all the way back to Jerusalem. So again, we saw this last week. These are foreshadows, forecastings of the civil war and the split in Israel that's going to happen under David's son Solomon. It's already the seeds of that are already being planted here. And in some ways, I guess, you could even trace that to David's sin. David's sin is what ultimately brought this about. So really, it's possible even the split of the whole nation could be traced in a way to that failure of Israel's great king, David. It's serious business. So. so everybody goes, they go, and that's the rebellion. Uh, we'll come back to that as we move. So that's the outside rebellion. Israel's left David. Second, inside rebellion. So um, David comes to his house. He deals with, uh, um, he deals with these, um, his concubines that he had left there. Deals with them, sets them apart, provides for them, but doesn't go to be with them. And so that's um, a judgment for what happened with them while he was gone. Um, and he calls Amasa. Amasa is now the leader of the army. Remember, he was the commander for Absalom. So when David regains control, he doesn't fire him. But he blesses him. It's a peacemaking effort of David. He's showing grace to his enemies. We would, you know, think he deserves to die. He was serving on the other side. David doesn't kill him, doesn't even demote him. In an absolute amazing show of grace, he lets him remain the general of the armies of, Israel, of, of Judah here. So he calls him and says, hey, get your guys and go follow this guy Sheba because this means trouble. He's stirring up rebellion. It's going to be worse than Absalom, he says. So uh, David has gotten over that in some way, if he's able to speak like that. So yeah, he goes, and they give him three days. They go three days, gather everybody, and then we ride. So they looked for him on dawn of the, of the third day. He wasn't there. So uh, David's a little antsy about it. And uh, maybe that's not that much time anyway. 
And David says, well, this is, this is terrible. So he sends out, calls Joab, Abishai, to go out and go chase Sheba and bring with them all the army, the rest of the armies of Judah, all the mighty men, the Carathites, Kareth, 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 the Pelethites, these guys, and all the mighty men of David. They go with Joab and Abishai to go pursue Sheba. So far, so good. But then it says that they met Amasa at the stone, at great stone at Gibeon. And you know, Joab, you don't like Joab already. You don't like him for what he did to Absalom and striking him down. Uh, you really don't like him for what he does here. David, the one he serves, has, he got fired from his job. Doesn't mean he's not still in some control in the army and doesn't have a position, but he was demoted from leading all the army of David. And so this guy had taken his place. So Joab is filled with jealousy and revenge and anger. He's not, his heart is not so worried about David's enemies. David sent him to, to go get Sheba. He's worried about his own enemies. So he meets Amasa and greets him with peace. And he's walking up to him and it said he had a sword on his sheath there. The language is a little confusing there. But apparently as he's walking up, this, his sword falls out. Maybe he did this on purpose. So the sword falls out, so he stoops down to get it. So now he's got it in his left hand. And Amasa doesn't really, um, doesn't see it. So he goes up to him, greets him, grabs him by the beard, come in for a nice brotherly kiss. I don't want to see you guys do that after church, but you know. <laughs> Comes in for that with the kiss, and then whoop, stabs him, shanks him right in the belly. One one strike, and it's not pretty. It's a death blow, and Amasa falls there on the highway. It's, root, it, it's just brutal, because he's laying there, wallowing in his blood right on the highway, and these guys are calling, you know, he had men with him too. And so now Joab's guys are saying, hey, whoever's for Joab, and especially whoever's for David, you've got to follow Joab now. And, but everyone stopped when they saw Amasa. This was the one, this was David's general here. When they saw him on the road, they stopped and they, did, they were confused. They didn't know what to do. So I took him off the road, covered him up with, with, with a garment. And then every, everyone goes now with Joab. This, is, this rebellion is worse than Sheba. It's worse. Isn't it worse? An outside rebellion or someone who's not so close to you, that's bad enough. But this is another form of betrayal. Nothing hurts so bad as when someone you trust switches on you like that. And with Joab here, he's just being selfish. He's just thinking about his own, his pride has been hurt. So he wants revenge. So he's going to kill this guy so he can become commander again. Amazingly, he does become commander again. Now David knows what he did. And Joab's going to get his, but it's, it's not going to be David who does that. We'll find out before the end of David's story what happens to Joab. So he's going to get his, even though it seems like the judgment is asleep. There's a good lesson there. You know, Ecclesiastes talks about that. He says, because the judgment against sin is not executed right away, the hearts of people are given over to sin. Just because like, you're not struck down immediately when we walk in sin. Then we think, oh, that must be good. And that's, when, that, that's, a, that's a terrifying thing. That God sees, God knows, and He never forgets. And He'll let us go. And He'll let His enemies go in their sin. And He'll never check them in that until the dreadful end comes upon them swiftly. And He calls them to account. So, that's pretty terrifying. All right. So that's the inside rebellion. And then third point here, the wise woman and the melon. So Joab and everyone, they get to the city. He, he, he's, so Sheba, it seems like his rebellion is not as successful as it seemed like it was at first. Because where he is, is he's in his own little clan here, the Beekrites. And he's in one of their little cities. It's a big city in the area, but it's a little city. And uh, so he doesn't seem to have much support in the end. So they find him walled up in this city, and they go and they build siege works against it. You know, they bring out old Grand to the battering ram to knock down the front gate. Um, <laughs> whatever comes through that gate, hold your ground. <laughs> it's Lord of the Rings. Um, all right. 
so, uh, so, so this city's doomed, and they're going to at least be, be cut off from food and water and everything before too long. It's not looking good. So this wise woman here. We've, we've met wise women in the story of David here. Remember a couple chapters ago, the lady with the well. Another woman here. Wise woman uh, calls out to Joab over the wall. Calls Joab here, and yep, they have a conversation. She says, um, back in the days, they used to say about this city, Abel, you know, if you want counsel, if you need wisdom, come here because there's wise people here. She says, I'm one of those wise people. She doesn't use the word wise. The Bible uses the word wise about her. She is wise. But as she puts it, she's uh, peaceable. And she's a peacemaker. And that's exactly what she does here. And that shows us that a large portion of wisdom is in the ability to make peace. To make peace. There are different kinds of wisdoms. There's worldly wisdom and then there's godly wisdom. Worldly wisdom is ruthless. Worldly wisdom will use intelligence and cunning and everything to get revenge. And if this woman was wise in a worldly way, she'd probably figure out how to overthrow Joab or bring revenge upon him for even daring to mount up against her city. But instead, she's wise in a heavenly way, and she's able to look over that offense and find a way to bring the parties together and bring peace. So she's talking to him, and she wants to get down to the root of the matter. So she says, what's up? Why are you trying to destroy this? This is a city is a mother in Israel. And he said, I'm not trying to do that, but there's a cat in there named Sheba. Oh, yeah, we know him. So he says, if you just deliver him to us, we're good. She says, I'll do you one better. We're just going to throw his noggin over the wall to you and end the whole thing right here. So then she went to the rest of the city in her wisdom, and she persuaded everybody and the leaders of the city to do that very thing. They did it. They, they, you know, he was the problem. They were able to localize <laughs> you know, triangulate the problem, <laughs> whatever. You know, I said that in every 90s movie when they're trying to figure out something, like you got to triangulate the location. <laughs> it's pretty good. It's all this guy right here. And so, boom, dealt with it in a decisive manner. It's also something about wisdom, is when you come to make a decision and something to do, you do it. You do it with decision and you do it with confidence. And so they made the right move. They throw the, the, his, his noggin, melon, over the wall. And Joab blows the trumpet. Doo, 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 doo. And we need a sound effect for that. Um, and then they all go home and the city's saved. And Joab goes back to Jerusalem. And it says in the end here, uh, it talks about uh, in back in Jerusalem, Joab was in command of all the armies of Israel. So David let him resume his former position. Again, probably some wisdom in David. David is not animated by like quick revenge. David, I think here, I think, is trusting the Lord to bring this about in his own time. And he's going to allow that. And it is the glory sometimes to overlook an offense for the greater good. David in here is being so like this wise woman. He's seeing the bigger picture, and he's allowing this. To, he doesn't want to create any more problems in the meantime. And again, Joab's not going to escape. He's going to get his, because the Lord knows, and the Lord sees. And then it runs down this list of people that were serving in David's administration. And he's got his own private priest here, sort of like a chaplain to the king. Ira the Jairite was David's priest. And as we end the chapter on that note, Think of David. He's gone through this great suffering. He got kicked out of, it, of Jerusalem by his own son. The great rebellion against him. He's out in the wilderness again with a few loyal servants, basically. And then his son dies. He's heartbroken. He's going back to Israel. Uh, back to Jerusalem. Israel leaves him, although they do come back, I guess. But when he gets to Jerusalem, he's getting back to like business as usual. And I think this is a nice note the chapter ends on. Because this tells us that even through the ups and downs, not only did the Lord not forsake David, but David didn't forsake the Lord. David's not sinless. But he has, he has his own priest helping him here, and he, he's, a, he's a godly man through and through to the end. It is possible to continue to serve God through great difficulties. In David's case, he brought these difficulties upon himself, but even if he didn't, Beloved, it is possible. A lot of times people use this as an excuse. The difficulties, things are really tough for me right now or whatever happened. And 
I just can't serve God. I can't believe in God. I can't trust God because of this trial I'm going through. Well, that's the true test of faith there. Look at David here. Immense trials, but his faith did not waver, and he kept trusting God through the difficulties. There's a good lesson there for us as well. All right, so kind of a messy chapter. There it is. You don't like Sheba, son of a Bikri. There it is. So, All right. Let's turn to some applications and how this might... What, 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 what kind of goods can we get out of this? First application, an observation from <coughs> Sheba's rebellion. Unbelief is what drives rebellion against God. Notice what Sheba says here in his little poetic little couple bars here. We have no portion in David and we have no inheritance in the son of Jesse. That wasn't true. David was a good king and he had cared for them always, even through the rebellion. He's, a, he's shown that. He's a peacemaker. He's not going to cut them off. Uh, this right here is unbelief. Sheba doesn't believe that the Lord will bless him through God's anointed. And that unbelief is what drives the rebellion. And the same thing happens with us. Behind our sin and underneath it is really unbelief. It's we don't actually believe that God's going to take care of us and that God is for us and that He will bless us. We don't actually believe we'll get anything out of serving God. And that's one of the great lies is that there's no gain in serving the Lord. And it's not true. Uh, this is... Before we became believers, or maybe you are not a Christian here today, the reason that you find it difficult, this idea of serving God doesn't make sense, is because deep down in your heart, you don't actually think that He will do anything for you. You don't actually think He will bless you. Maybe you think, yeah, He'll bless others, but there's no way He'll bless me. I'm too far gone, and I've rebelled against Him far too long. There's no way. And we're saying the same thing here. There's no portion for me in Christ. There's no inheritance for me in the Lord, which is not true. As believers, we struggle with this. The reason that temptation and sin can seem so alluring sometimes to us is because we're forgetting about the Lord and we're thinking that He's not going to be able to make me happy in a way that this temptation, this sin will make me happy, I think. And we think the Lord, there's nothing for me in Him. Yeah, we say, okay, maybe, yeah, in heaven... I know when I die, I'll be with the Lord. But right here, right now, this is what I need. And I, and I don't have anything in Christ. And that, you see how that works to like encourage us to sin? Because like, yeah, why not? He's not going to do anything anyway. That's what drives our rebellion against the Lord. Hebrews famously says that whoever, um, that we will seek the Lord, that faith is what pleases God. And whoever would please Him must believe that He is and that He's a rewarder of those who seek Him. If you don't believe that God will bless and reward you for seeking Him, you'll never seek Him. If you believe God is stingy and harsh and legalistic and will never, never ever give or bless, of course you won't seek Him. And that's one of the great lies that Satan tells, the same one here that led this rebellion, is that there's nothing for us in the Lord. But it's not true. Part of faith, the part of the essence of faith, trusting in God, is the belief that He is kind to us, that He is he's, He lavishes riches upon us, that He loves us and blesses us in every way. So that's a, that's a good nugget there for us. As you're struggling with sin, or you're tempted to leave the Lord, or go against His commandments, or give in to temptation, do a heart check. And see if underneath there, maybe you're just not believing God's promises. And you don't really think that there's anything for you in Christ. It's not true. Second application. Uh, the gospel takes us from enemies to friends. Amasa here is this great picture. The, and this goes in the last chapter too. He was the leader of the army that was trying to kill David. He was the guy. Absalom appointed him to lead the charge. And he did. When they went out in that forest and fighting, Amasa was in charge. When David attains victory, we would expect David to execute this guy. 
You'd expect David to at least fire this guy. But what does David do? He lets him stay. He, he becomes his commander over his army. It's amazing what he does there. Something like that happens when we become believers. This amazing thing ha happens in a moment. We go from God's enemies to God's friends and God's servants. I think about Paul. This, you also see this in the life of Paul. Paul had this reputation as Saul when he was uh, persecuting Christians, going up and down, and it was his whole goal was to throw Christians in prison and lead them to death. Um, he became a Christian, <laughs> started preaching, uh, but there were some believers who, you know, they were only hearing this by the ear. They knew about Saul, and they were scared of Saul, but then they heard he was preaching. They didn't know what to, quite what to do with that. They were a little skeptical of that. But, you know, imagine the godliest believers at that time taking it on faith and believing. And when they met Paul, embracing him without hesitation, which so many of them did. They embraced him because they understood that in the gospel, we don't earn our way up to God. We don't earn our way to righteousness it happens in a moment and it's pictured there in Paul's conversion as a preacher instantly and Amasa here remaining the general and the same thing's true of us when we trust in Christ instant switch we got to remember that as believers because as we go on we start to think well I've fallen from grace so now I got to work myself back up to that same thing for us always to the end of our days is we are instantly in Christ and we are instantly in grace we have to remember that if you're outside of Christ that's the promise of the gospel not you can get your life together look the gospel's not God will help you get your life together it's not even that the gospel is it's finished he's already done it and he will transform you and make you his own in a moment simply by trusting him simply by calling out to him and asking him to save it's amazing Okay, third application then. Jesus is the wise man who saves the city. This wise woman, she's rowdy here. Doesn't give a name, but she's, the, these themes are here. Anytime in Scripture, especially in the Old Testament here, you have a, a wise woman or a mighty woman that God uses to bring deliverance and salvation, you're thinking of the original gospel promise through the seed of the woman. God would overthrow the works of the devil and save his people through the seed of the woman. So this wise woman appears, and what she does here, it also contains another thread from Genesis in that promise that God gave to Eve that the seed of the woman would do what? Crush the head of the serpent. And this wise woman here, the way that she saves the city is through crushing the head, beheading the enemy and throwing that head over there and in that one act peace was brought and the tensions were eased um, there's another story like this it's in Ecclesiastes so I'll read it real quick um, Solomon David's son would later say this I have also seen this this example of wisdom under the Sun and it seemed great to me there was a little city with a few men in it, and a great king came against it and besieged it, building great siege works against it. But there was found in it a poor wise man, and he by his wisdom delivered the city. Yet no one remembered that poor man. But I say that wisdom is better than might, though the poor man's wisdom is despised, and his words are not heard. So, in this picture of the wise woman saving the city or the wise man here, there's also a Christ figure here. Um, delivering the city, this unknown, I mean, they don't give the name of the woman here. In a sense, she's remembered as a wise woman, but she's not remembered by name, she's forgotten. Just like the wise man here, who saved the city, is forgotten and not known, though he saved the city, just like she did. That is a picture of our Lord who through his wisdom has delivered us by crushing the head of the serpent. When Jesus died for our sins on the cross, he did the wisest thing that could, you could imagine. And he got right down to the issue, right down to the problem. And that's our sin. That's our problem. You know, our problem's not other people. Our problem's not our circumstances. Our problem is not the things that happen to us. 
Our problem is our sin. That's our problem. It's our sin. And Jesus on the cross took that and he got right down to the issue. And when he died for our sins, he crushed the head of the serpent. And in that one act, peace was made. Not between us and some other people, but between us and the very armies of heaven. Between us and the true and living God. Peace has been made because a sacrifice has been wrought because Christ died. But he fits this bill. Jesus is the poor righteous teacher who is not remembered. I mean, he's remembered. People know his name. But are the words of Christ truly remembered and treasured? Nah. We know commonly, you know, popularly. We know about the Bible. We've heard the name of Jesus. We know about church. But to really get down there in the words of Christ and see what he actually said, that is, that is largely neglected. His words are forgotten, and his life is despised in that way. And yet we shouldn't be surprised by that, Solomon says, because that happens. And so when we serve Christ in the gospel, we're serving our Lord who's despised and forgotten by the world, but we know. Just think, that woman might have been forgotten by others, but the people that were there when she did that, they remembered her. They knew what she did. It was imprinted upon their hearts and minds. When we trust in Christ, it's like that. We get a front row view. We see what our Lord has done. And we do remember by his wisdom. The gospel is an amazing expression of God's wisdom. When we think of God, we think of his power. He's got omnipotency, almighty. There's no limit to his power. When we think about the Lord, we know that his knowledge is vast and infinite. That he sees and knows everything. But when we talk about God's wisdom, that's, that's something different than just knowledge or power. It's, he, he has struck that hidden path in order to save us and to punish sin and to remain righteous in Christ. And he's delivered us in this wise way through the gospel. So as we study Christ, as we contemplate the gospel, we see their notes of God's amazing wisdom. Who would have ever thought of this he would because he is wise and let us rejoice in that wisdom as Christ died for our sins beloved and crushed the head of the serpent beheaded him threw that head over the wall and the war has been called off and we are not enemies of God any longer we are God's friends now because of what he did let's pray Father, please bless us with your truth, and may Christ be exalted. Pray in Jesus' name, amen.